I've done quite a few videos on bands from the Sunset Strip, and I've got more in the pipeline. When I think of the Sunset Strip, I think of debauchery and having a good time. But Striper seemed to be the antithesis of everything going on. They would not only be the biggest selling Christian band of the time, but the biggest band from Orange County as well. Today, let's focus on the early years of Striper, up until their breakup in the early 90s, and how they brought religion to the Sunset Strip and beyond. Before we can really talk about Striper, we have to look at how religion and popular music went hand in hand, leading up to the 1980s. It all began in churches with gospel music that was heavily influenced by the blues, which first became popular during the Roaring Twenties. Of course, with anything that's popular in music, record labels came calling, signing numerous gospel singers. By the middle of the 20th century, this style of gospel music started influencing the big artists of the day, including Elvis, Johnny Cash, and Hank Williams. Popular musicians at the time typically had several gospel numbers they would perform, and by the 60s, psychedelic rock acts influenced by religion soon sprouted up, including Larry Norman and All Saved Freak Band. By the 80s, though, country music started to adopt more religious undertones, while rock and roll seemed to stray further away, with punk taking aim at organized religion. Soon enough, metal bands including Merciful Fate, Wasp, and Venom would become the targets of religious groups as well as the PMRC for corrupting America's youth. That's where Striper came in. Hailing from Orange County, Striper was formed by two brothers in 1983, vocalist and singer Michael and his drumming brother Robert Sweet. Originally calling themselves Rocks and then Rocks Regime after someone else was found to have the name, the band became a common sight around LA's hottest clubs at the time, including the Whiskey O Go Go, the Troubadour, and Gazaris. And it was at those gigs the band could frequently be seen covering the Judas Priest song, Breaking the Law. The brothers would see musicians come and go in their band in the early years, including future Poison guitarist CeCe DeVille. He eventually left the group after disagreements over the band's onstage fashion. The band would soon find stability with the addition of guitarist Oz Fox and bassist Tim Gaines. The band would catch the attention of Bill and Wes Hine, who were co-founders of Green World Distribution, who owned Enigma Records. The label loved the sound of the band, only requesting they change their name. The Para brothers soon changed their name to Striper, using a Y instead of an I, so people wouldn't accidentally refer to them as Stripper. The name refers to the lashings or stripes Jesus got from the Romans. Soon enough, the band would adopt the colors of yellow and black, and even use a passage from the Bible in the band's logo. Striper would even serve as an acronym standing for salvation through redemption, yielding peace, encouragement, and righteousness. What's funny though is that Enigma Records didn't even know Striper was a religious band. Their live shows and demos had the vocals so muddled they couldn't really make out what the lyrics said. And it wasn't until they got into the studio for their first EP in 1984 that they finally realized that Striper was a Christian band. That producer Ron Gowdy recalled in the book Nothing But A Good Time, they hid the whole Jesus thing from us for a while. Wes Hine, who signed the band, recalled in the same book, the lyrics were a lot cleaner in the studio than on the bad cassette dub they'd given us. We're listening and one line is Jesus is my way. We look at each other and we look at Robert and Michael. There's silence and we say, are you guys Christians? And they're like, yes. But religion wasn't always a part of the band's music. In the early days, they were like any other band from the Sunset Strip. Frontman Michael Sweet would tell the Washington Post in 1985 how religion found its way into the band's music, revealing how the band was confronted by a friend who said, if you guys really give yourselves back to the Lord, you'll go straight to the top. We weren't really thinking of that kind of success, but we knew we were Christians that hadn't been living the part, so we decided to take his advice. We looked pretty much the same as we do today, and the music was pretty much the same. All we had to do was change a few words here and a few words there, and everything fit perfectly, he'd recall. The band would even wear their religious beliefs on stage, with drummer Robert Sweet having the words Jesus Christ Rocks emblazoned on the back of his drum throne. In addition to that, the band became famous for throwing Bibles into the audience, but not all members of their faith were happy to have the band on their side. According to the Washington Post, it wasn't uncommon to sometimes see religious groups pick up their shows. Robert Sweet would tell the same newspaper, there's always resistance. The only reason it's there is that some people have never seen us in concert. Throwing Bibles to the crowd, some people think that's disrespectful. That's not why we do it. We think it's great to get the good book out there. Sweet would go on to say the band frequently ran out of Bibles and shows, 
it would be one of the band's fiercest critics, a woman named Darren Hinton, who was part of a ministry called Eagle's Nest. She believed the band was actually trying to profit off of God's name, but it wasn't until she saw the band open for Bon Jovi in the early 80s that her opinion of them suddenly changed. She was impressed by the crowd's reaction to the band and soon became the group's first manager and even loaned them $100,000 to help produce their first EP. Their first release for Enigma would be the EP Yellow and Black Attack in 1984. The EP would be turned into a full-length album in 1986 with a few songs added. Following the success of their 1985 album, Soldiers Under Command, which went gold, they would follow that up with 1986's To Hell With The Devil, which became the group's biggest selling record going platinum, and it was the first Christian rock album to sell over a million copies. The album produced three huge singles with Honestly, Calling On You, and Free, all of which got heavy rotation on MTV and were some of the most requested videos at the time. Honestly would be the group's only single to be a top 40 hit on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. While Christian Radio initially was hesitant to embrace the band, they eventually warmed up to Striper. But the same couldn't be said for Christian TV, who frontman Michael Sweet believed didn't like rock and roll in general. Not that it really mattered though because MTV embraced the band, and Striper even made an appearance on the 80s sitcom Golden Girls. It would be ironic that despite wearing religion on their sleeves, they didn't appreciate the label of being a Christian band. It would be strange because it was that angle that helped Striper succeed. The media loved the angle of a Christian heavy metal band, and magazines from Forbes all the way to adult men's magazines couldn't resist not covering the band. Michael Sweet would push back though against the Washington Post revealing heavy metal bands don't usually have ballads, don't usually have four part harmonies and don't usually throw Bibles into the audience. And when anyone says Christian band, that immediately sounds boring, 15 years behind the times. I choose to call it God Rock, he'd say. The band even rejected the idea of only doing bills that had other Christian bands on them, as they felt their message would only get to those people who were already part of the same tribe. The band frequently toured with other hair metal acts, including Rat. Striper followed up to Hell with the Devil with 1988's and God We Trust, which went gold, selling over half a million copies. But by 1990, the band's career took a different turn when they released the album Against the Law. Striper would change their image, their lyrical themes, and even stop throwing Bibles into the audience and would become more secular. The band wanted to do something different and was tired of being typecast as a Christian rock band and not being taken seriously by a large segment of the rock community. That's not to say the members lost all their religious convictions. They still wanted to spread the word of God but only to those who seek it out, with frontman Michael Sweet telling the LA Times, we're going to work in some of our old tunes that tell about God and Christ. We're not going to be ashamed of that and run from that. If they want to know about God, they can come talk to us about it. In some ways, the attention Striper got as a Christian band worked to our advantage. In other ways, it was a disadvantage as far as being labeled the Christian boys of rock and roll. There were people who might have been into us if they hadn't heard the term Christian band, but it turned them off, he'd say. Some of those who were turned off included the band's longtime backers who wanted Striper to stay with their Christian rock image. In fact, the title Against the Law, Sweet would claim, was aimed at those who wanted to shape the band according to an image or law of their own. It was also around this time the band saw a big change in management, hiring the company Gold Mountain Management, headed by future Nirvana manager Danny Goldberg. Previously, the band had been managed by the Sweet Brothers' mother, and the band would also sign a new recording contract with Hollywood Records after their old label Enigma folded. This change in direction proved to be unsuccessful as Against the Law wouldn't even go gold in America. By January of 1992, frontman Michael Sweet would leave the band to pursue a solo career, leaving the other members to pick up the pieces. Sweet would tell the LA Times following his departure, It was a lot of things tied up together. I don't know if I've gotten old or what, but I'm not a metal guy anymore. I could have stayed in Striper and forced a more mainstream direction, but nobody would have been happy. Without a lead singer, the band would receive some more bad news when their record label dropped them after only one release. The band tried to audition some new singers and played a few shows with some stand-ins before guitarist Oz Fox took over vocals. But by 1993, the band disbanded as other members pursued different musical projects. But in 1999, the band would reform at the Striper Expo. From 2005 onwards, Striper would put out frequent new releases, all of which would show up on the Billboard album charts, showing that they still had a significant following. However, there would prove to be a pretty ugly falling out between bassist Tim Gaines and the other members of the band following his departure in 2017. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe. We'll see you again on Rock and Roll True Stories. Take care.